Hi, I'm Bill Brockrup, Artistic Director of NTS Theatre Company, and welcome to the NTS Book Club. In this chapter, we talk about George Kaufman and Moss Hart's 1936 comedy, You Can't Take It With You. It's a production we did in the fall of 2012, and we're lucky tonight to have the director of that production, Gigi Birmingham, along with special guests, Karen Melina White and Verilyn Jones, who share the role of Reba. The evening is hosted by Alice Johnston, our Director of Development. So sit back and enjoy. Uh, before we jump into the conversation, we have a slideshow with some background information about the play just to get us started. So Courtney, if you'd like to share, uh, share our slideshow. Here's some photos from the NTS production. So George Kaufman was an American playwright, theater director, producer, humorist, and drama critic. In addition to comedies and political satire, he wrote several musicals for the Marx Brothers and others. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama for the musical of The I Sing in 1932 and won again in 1937 for the play You Can't Take It With You with Moss Hart, which we're talking about today. He also won the Tony Award for Best Director in 1951 for Guys and Dolls. Many of Kaufman's plays were adapted into Hollywood and British films. Among the more well-received were Dinner at Eight, Stage Door, almost completely rewritten by others for the film version, and You Can't Take It With You, changed significantly by others for the film version, which won the Best Picture Oscar in 1938 and Dark, The Dark Tower from 1943. Moss Hart was an American playwright and theater director. After working several years as a director of amateur theater, theatrical groups and an entertainment director at summer resorts, he scored his first Broadway hit with Once in a Lifetime in 1930, a farce about the arrival of the sound era in Hollywood. The play was written in collaboration with Broadway veteran George S. Kaufman, who regularly wrote with others, notably Mark Connolly and Edna Ferber. You Can't Take It With You, the story of an eccentric family and how they live during the Depression won the 1937 Pulitzer Prize for Drama. It's Hart's most revived play. When director Frank Capra and writer Robert Riskin adapted it for the screen in 1938, the film won the Best Picture Oscar and Capra won for Best Director. About the play. So at first the sycamores may seem mad, but it's not long before we realize that if they are mad, the rest of the world is madder. In contrast to these delightful people are the unhappy Kirby's. The plot shows how Tony, an attractive young son of the Kirby's falls in love with Alice Sycamore and brings his parents to dine at the Sycamore home on the wrong evening. The shock sustained by the Kirby's who were invited to eat cheap food shows Alice that marriage with Tony is out of the question. The Sycamores, however, though sympathetic to Alice, find it hard to realize her point of view. M meantime, Tony, who knows the Sycamores are right and his own people are wrong, will not give her up. And in the end, Mr. Kirby is converted to the happy madness of the Sycamores, particularly since he happens uh, in during a visit by an ex-grand duchess er uh, earning her living as a waitress. No mention has as yet been made of the strange activities of certain members of the household engaged in the manufacture of fireworks, nor of the printing press set up in the parlor, nor of Reba the maid and her friend Donald, nor of grandpa's interview with the tax collector when he tells him he doesn't believe in the income tax. Mm -hmm. So now about our guest speakers for this evening. Uh, Gigi Birmingham grew up in Northern California and attended UC Berkeley, graduating with a degree in dramatic art. She's won numerous acting honors, including two LA Stage Alliance Ovation Awards and an LA Drama Critics Circle Award, and was named Most Watchable Actress by the LA Weekly for her multiple character comedy, Non-Vital Organs. She's a member of Antius Theatre Company, where she teaches in the academy, directs, and where she has performed in many productions, including Native Sun, Cloud Nine, Picnic, The Liar, The Seagull, Mother Courage, etc. Gigi has performed alongside such luminaries as Angela Bassett, Alfred Molina, Gregory Hines, Lizzie Kaplan, Jim Parsons, Andre Brower, Alison Brie, and many others. Karen Molina White is an American film and television actress. She's best known for her roles as Kenesha Carter in the 1989 drama film Lean on Me 
and Charmaine Brown during the two final seasons on The Cosby Show and its spinoff, A Different World. Nicolette Vandross on Malcolm and Eddie and the voice of Dijanae Jones on the Disney Channel animated comedy, The Proud Family. Karen studied at the Philadelphia High School for Creative and Performing Arts. After graduating high school, she continued her studies at Howard University, where she graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. During her senior year, Karen won the title of Miss Howard University and landed her first role as an actress. At Antius, Karen has been part of our productions of Eight Nights, You Can't Take It With You, The Liar, Wedding Band, and As You Like It. Farrellyn Jones is an award-winning actress who has worked at the Denver Center, South Coast Repertory, Mark Taper Forum, the Kirk Douglas Theater, and internationally at La Scala Theater at Stockholm, Sweden. She is also known for her roles in Southland, ER, and Seinfeld. Farrellyn is a native of Granada, West Indies, and grew up in New York. She earned a degree in dance from Brooklyn College. In 2010, she, along with her husband and two colleagues, founded Lower Depth Theater, a 501c3 nonprofit, where she currently serves as associate artist producer. At Antius, Fairlyn has been in our productions of Wedding Band, A Love Hate Story in Black and White, and You Can't Take It With You. She's also participated in a number of Classics Fest readings, such as Metamorphosis, The Trojan Women, The Rover, Along the River, Almost Winter, The Life of Galileo, Caesar and Cleopatra, and The African Women. So those uh, are our esteemed guests, and here we have um, a little selection of a video from the original production. Okay, let me try again. Keep still. Everybody in this house is under arrest. Shut up, all of you. Shut up. All right, so um, we'll we'll get started with our conversation. I should say we do normally have um, our artistic director Bill, or previously we had Kitty here hosting, uh, but Bill is out of town. So tonight it is our our esteemed group of three speakers from their 2012 production, and uh, to some extent I'll be helping that along. Um, so to start off, I wanted to ask ask uh, Gigi if you initiated the project or how you came to be involved and and now you can hear me um yes thanks for asking um actually i i was an actor in the company i guess i'd expressed some interest in directing and we had um a younger company at the time called a2 and in, and then that company came out of the academy and they were excited about doing late night um, offerings. And so I started directing them in their late night offerings. And Jeff Doba, who's a member of that uh, company, um, he asked me if I would direct You Can't Take It With You, which, no, no, it was a reading. I'm so sorry, it was a reading of You Can't Take It With You, which meant I was to sit at the table as the, you know, I, I could, I guess, cast the actors. He knew what he wanted to play. And then we would cast the actors together. And I would sit there as they read the play. But we all enjoyed it so much that night that we decided to make a, a, a play for, you know, you know to, to, to request of the artistic uh, directors. Wait a minute, was it Jeannie at the time? Um, um, no, 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 it was no. Bill and Bill. It was the triumvirate. And so we asked them to consider it for production. And we really pushed hard. All of the cast members in that reading. Was either of you in that reading? Yeah, I was. Carolyn, okay. 
And do you remember how excited we all were at the end of that yes, night? Yes, it was it was a fun read. Yeah, mm -hmm. we like we want to we want to do this show. So we really made a push push for it, and somehow it happened. And I was attached. So although I wasn't much of a tried director, I I was attached to the project, which was wonderful. And of course, they could have replaced me, but they didn't. And uh, <laughs> that's that that's how it came to be because an actor proposed it to the company and wanted to play the role of Koryenko. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, and so then uh, you were you were the one who suggested that we invite Verilyn and Karen to be part of our conversation tonight. So I'll sort of hand it over to you a little bit to talk about why you wanted to talk with them and then to talk with them about uh, about your memories of the production. Well, um, you know, I, I'm sure this is a you know tired topic maybe to for them for Verilyn and Karen, but for me it's still a very fresh topic the the diversity issue and how do we go forward. Um, I don't know about you all, but I have a different perspective on my country than I had, um, you know, a year and a half ago. I've gotten an education, small education, and I just don't feel quite the way that I always did. My parents um, came out of the Second World War. My mother was French. My dad brought her over in 1945. So she was just a little bit younger than the young women in, in you can't take, than the young woman, women, yes, the young girls in You Can't Take It With You, the, the, uh, the daughters. Um, but I grew up with a great pride for our country and how we rescued the world from the world, Second World War and so on. And I have a different perspective now on what uh, this country came out of and um, I mean, how we, we, the whole basis of the country in my perspective now is that we, we are a country that uh, grew out of using slaves to build the foundation of this country. So I, um, in terms of casting and just working in general in the theater and in film and television, I'm, I'm no longer interested in moving forward in the way that we had. And with Antias being a classical theater company, what do we do when most of the plays that we've ever done have been written by white men uh, in previous uh, centuries? How do we proceed? What can we do? How can we continue to use some of, obviously we're gonna have to find, make a shift in terms of the material we use, but some of that material is still beautiful. Like, like you can't take it with you. And, how can we use that material and still honor um, this shift in how we, we behave as a society, as a community, um, with respect to the people who in the past we have not uh, respected or given their fair uh, due. So, uh, so I invited Karen Berlin because it's very much on my mind. And, you know, and could we have possibly done this play? Could we do this play ever? Because in this particular play, and you guys will speak to this more than I, but the, the, um, the maid, Reba, and her boyfriend, who she's not married to, Donald, um, speak about the white people and, you know, identify themselves as Black. So it's not like you could cast, I mean, I did, I did do another production where I cast a white person as Donald and I had a multi-racial cast um, throughout. And we did even in this production, we had an Asian woman as one of the daughters and a, and a black guy as, as one of the um, sons-in-law. But, uh, but it was color conscious casting. It wasn't color blind casting, it was color conscious. And, I just didn't see how to, I, I, I couldn't see how to do anything but cast black women in the role of Reba uh, because of the references to being black and the references to the white family. But mm. I would be curious to know what, what you guys think about that. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a weird, um, it, you know, that's, that's, that's a hard one too when it specifically states that um, I know Sometimes I don't know. You get permission to change something. I don't know who does that. You know that's been done. I know once I did a reading of uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and I got to play, uh, you know, as a black woman playing the role. But um, I think sometimes that can be a, a, an option. I don't know if the states would actually allow, you know, people to do that to change certain things in the writing. I don't have an answer for that one, quite frankly. Um, you know, if it's specifically stated that way. I don't know, Karen, what do you think? Yeah, um, I don't know how you get around that either. Uh, when- In when, this play. In the text. Mm -hmm. when you know, 
things mm -hmm. like that. Um, but, you know, I think it was, um, this was my first production at Antius. And um, I think, Vera Lynn, you gave them my name. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. I, I, I remember auditioning and, you know, being in the room and uh, Gigi and Bill um, and others. Um, for me, at the time, this was, it, I was just so excited. Um, I didn't know about Antius, um, but I really loved the piece and I loved the character Reba. I just thought she was hilarious mm -hmm. and she wasn't your typical maid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I just loved, you know, who she was and how she fit in with this family. And, and I loved the family. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was, it was really a joy. Um, I just thought the production was, was hilarious and Gigi's direction. Um, it, it was also, um, I, you know, I just have such fond memories. Um, this was, I was introduced to um, <clears throat> the double casting. So I'm getting to watch Vera Lynn and her create her own Reba. And, you know, just this whole technique and it, it was just so exciting and so refreshing. And I just, you know, I fell in love with Antius and how it's approached everything. And I loved, you know, Brian Vincent Anderson as, you know, black man and his son-in-law and Linda Park and, you know, but everybody was just so wonderful. And it, it was such, um, you, sorry, I have planes. Um, <laughs> Well, they're not mine, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it was such a wonderful production and, um, and I enjoyed myself tremendously. And, and it's just so, for me, I just love the fact that plays come into my life at the right time to really help me personally. And at this time I was uh, struggling with um, having to file for bankruptcy and I had all of this shame about you know having money and then not having any more of it and you know what do I do and just really struggling and you know that the whole notion and seeing the duchess come in and she's waiting tables and you know so the, all of the themes in this just really helped me personally move past my own shame and things around money so it it this i just have such fond memories so mm -hmm. i digress i don't even know if i answered the question but um i love that that means so much to me to hear you say that mm -hmm. um and i remembered mate i did i did do everything i could possibly i remember lying awake at night and and consulting experts and i have friends who are in politics and asking and um you know sociopolitical people and asking them what can i do with this play to make this black white issue more palatable um and and so I was helped by Christopher Breyer, who was our dramaturg at the time. I don't know if he still is. And he made suggestions about how and we created a whole backstory for Donald that he was a maybe he was a Pullman Porter. And then the the um, the Depression came and that's why he was on the dole. And there was no shame about being on the dole. And he and Grandpa were kind of on an equal footing. And he and Grandpa had an understanding. And that's why they they talked like you know, as they, as equals, because they felt that they were equals and, and also having you guys sit at the table with the family, that's not in the, that's not in the text, you know, so I tried to add anything I could that would demonstrate what you're talking about, Karen, the, the, you know, the, basically it was a family that, that was about love and mm -hmm. non-discrimination and acceptance and inclusivity. And that, that, that's the irony about this play is, I don't know if you could do it today, but that's what the play is about. It's about inclusivity. Well, I think um, everything that Karen said, really, I, I agree with it. And one of the reasons why it was okay in my mind to do it, uh, and, and quite frankly, it wasn't even that much of a thought for me. I know um, it was because of how it was handled. And I think in future, that's really, if we're going to do certain plays, I think that always should be in the forefront of directors and dramaturgs, that you have to find ways to make, and just the choices you made in, in having us 
sit at the table and having more of a part of the family as opposed to just showing up and dropping something off, picking up and going. It felt to me like I was as much a part of the family as everybody else. And the mere fact that, you know, Donald is living in the home, you know, there has to be some sort of acceptance of him um, and judgments that, that didn't seem to be the judgment that you would think because of that. And so um, I think it, it, in, in everything we do, we have to think broader than we've thought before um, in order to make um, diversity when inclusive, you know, just to include people. Uh, it has to be in the forefront of our minds in, in every situation. And some with some plays, it's adaptable again, but it's not always as clear cut. But I like the fact that you did go to someone else to get information and to try to find ways to um, to make your values come through in the play as opposed to it being just this black you know woman working and you know not being a part of it and uh it i think that that was for me the only thing that made me feel like okay i can do this without feeling like i was being demeaned or anything like that um but it, it was a fun production. There was so much going on at any given time. And then to show you that um, this casting of having um, Ryan as the, the son-in-law and, and, and um, you know, Linda being Asian and he being African-American, that was not even an issue. I don't think, has that ever come up to you, uh, for you in the play or even reviews? I don't think that was an issue. I think people are very accepting of things once they see something, you know? If you, if you don't see it, you know, if it's being presented to you in such a way, then you, it's not difficult to say, oh, she's black and how, I mean, she's Asian and how could he, I, I think as a society, first of all, we're a little bit beyond that. I mean, we're getting to the point where that's not such a shock. I mean, several years ago, that would be like, no. But um, I think we're moving forward. The fact that we are, it's in our consciousness now, we just have to broaden that and see where it takes us. And we have to trust that it's something that can happen. You know, I, I, you know, I think audiences, as a whole, it's, you know, we have to offer them things too, to open themselves up, to get them to think and to, to be more accepting of things. And when they see it, it's easier to, um, to take in. Yeah, well, when you think of the, the play, I mean, I mean, the, you know, the, the gentle uh, massaging that we did was pretty small in, in terms of the actual, the whole of the play. And in 1936, can you mm -hmm. imagine mm -hmm. people seeing Reba, who was really like the, the matriarch of the family, the backbone. <laughs> She's you know, the backbone of the family. <laughs> yeah. And living with a man and, and, you know, and the whole thing um, must have been pretty shocking at the time, but people embraced it. People embraced mm -hmm. it. Feel a surprise. But I think what was important for me too, that scene that between Donald and Reba at the end, I think it came in second act or something, where they do acknowledge, there is that acknowledgement between them. And I think that's something that, um, I think that was pretty honest. And I think um, that being placed there was another factor for me, that it wasn't something that me as a Reba being so oblivious that I'm not aware of you know, the politics or of, of what's, you know, between blacks and, and, and whites in the day. So, um, you know, cause you know, the folks will speak to talk to themselves, you know, when it comes down to it. And I think that was an important scene to, to have in the play. Mm -hmm. So Gigi, another question that I had for you was you, I think you mentioned this was, you were early in your sort of directing career. It's obviously a big ensemble cast. Um, what was that like for you? How did you approach that in terms of casting? And then also just in terms of stage direction, as we saw in that clip, it's very dynamic. You have people moving all over the stage. Uh, what, what was that like? And what were you sort of trying to keep in mind as you were bringing all of that together? Wow, uh, um, I just loved it. I loved, um... I love the challenge of so many people on a small set. We had a, as you all, the, some of you may have seen the show, you might recall we had a very narrow stage, but was pretty deep. deep yeah. So the design took that into account. And it's kind of miraculous when I think about what we were able to do with that large of a cast. Um, and, and when I looked at the clips that, besides the clip that we saw today that John Apicella had sent to us, I watched a little bit of of both of them, it's kind of a, the quality of the casts 
two huge casts and the quality of the, both casts, the, the, the depth of talent is kind of amazing. And we weren't, and at the time we didn't get paid. I mean, we got a little stipend or something, but we were members of the company. We were just doing it for the joy of doing it. Um, but I, how did how did it, how did I handle? It? I don't know. It was like um, it was like moving big pieces of a puzzle around so that you can see everybody at the same time, and then the people who are you know uh, being focused on. You make sure that the light is on them, and you make sure everybody else is a little more still so that you can see the people who are trying. It was just it's basic um, it's basic directing, but. Um, I guess a little bit to me I what I didn't want was what I had seen clips of which was everybody's static and then the people talking get to move and everybody else is just static I thought it's just this household is too alive everybody has to be alive every moment and we'll just get used to kind of the chaos and there'll just be a little more chaos with the people who are who's you know who need to command the focus that's all that's all um we had Tom Betterwitz our set designer who was brilliant mm -hmm. so helpful you know, and able to, in that small set, able to create that staircase and everything that you need for the, for the, the, the drama to work. A little area in the back where people could lurk, but they were there, you could see them, but they didn't steal focus. And it, it was very, it was challenging, but I didn't think of it as challenging. It's like, it really is like putting the pieces of the puzzle together. It was so fun, so fun. And what was what was it like to cast you you know you mentioned it's dual cast so it's I don't know how 30 some actors you had to cast in in those different roles. I remember it was uh, that's a big big part of, of directing obviously is you know 90% of directing is casting right and I remember just sweating over it sweating over it and we had three grandpas. Mm -hmm. Why did we have three I think because did somebody get sick that. Uh... No, they, I think it was people's schedule. I think somebody had, had to do something at some point they were going to drop off. So we had, we had three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they couldn't commit to the whole time. So yeah. even though we had double casting, but at one point we had to have three. Yeah. <laughs> three incredible actors. Yeah. From grandpa. Um, but how did we cast? I mean, it was, uh, it was e I mean, easy from that. I mean, you know, you get, Three or four people who are great for a part, and then you just choose which which ones you want to you want to put in there. Obviously, we had to bring in Karen from outside because we didn't have we hardly had any people of color in the company then. We do have a number of people of color in the company now. I'm seeing it I'm seeing it expanding and growing, and um, that's thrilling. And I, that I think will only continue going forward. But at the time, it would, that was that part was challenging. That part was really challenging. But otherwise. Um, um, you know, to see actors who you haven't seen seen do comedy or you haven't seen do this kind of comedy come forward and present themselves. I remember one of the actors, can we speak in specifics? Maybe not. <laughs> one, of the act, one of the actors I had in mind from the beginning, you know, sometimes the director will just be like, I know who I want for this part. And it was a pivotal role. And um, that actor came in and they were kind of flat. And they left. And um, I ran out after them and said, just wait here a minute. And I came back in and, and the other artistic staff was like, yeah, no. And I was like, okay, please, please let's bring, her, bring this person back to callbacks. And I think it's gonna be all right. And I ran back out to this person and I said, hey, you gotta bring it to callbacks and I'm gonna talk to you on the phone. I talked to them on the phone and kind of, you know, and they had, they had you know, as actors often do, they had the psychological thing about auditioning, you know, your career can can be can turn on a bad audition. So that and that and that person came back and they brought it on the second audition and they got cast. So that was the only person that I did that with. It was a role that was difficult to cast. And uh um yeah. But and then the other role that was difficult to cast was um Tony, the young, the young um gallant. And that that's that always seems to be sort of a difficult role, I think, in general, because young studly men are often just completely focused on their television and film careers, of course. I mean, most of us are anyway, but they are more so. And and you don't I'm just gonna be blunt, you don't find as many of those in a theater company you find more character actors in a theater company. And um, 
we had to bring in somebody from the outside for for that role, actually. Now I remember. Well, we lost an actor. Yeah, we had an actor and he got cast in a movie and that was it, he was gone. And then we were like, we don't have anybody else in the company. So we had to go looking outside. Um, yeah. So I, when we were when we were chatting the other day, I think I think all three of you had some some memories from the production that you were you were enjoying reminiscing about. But uh, any anything that comes to mind that you want to share about why you have special memories if you can't take it with you? The one that I I enjoyed was the the G men that comes in at the end of the play. Uh, yeah, I mean we had a big enough. Um, cast on the stage every night and then at the end we get, add more people so that was fun because each night um i think it was it was it wasn't every night it was i think certain nights and the in the run that um they'd step in maybe was it a friday or something but anyway they'd step in every now and again and changed all the actors so we knew g men coming in every you know whenever we did that switch over and sometimes we didn't even at some points i didn't even know before i went on stage who was going to be coming on so you never knew sometimes who was going to be playing that night and it was always kind of interesting to see different actors take on things because sometimes it could be completely different so it's just the actor the, you know, that brings the, 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 uh, the role in and um, they all had different takes on it. And it was kind of interesting every night because we all had to adjust to it. You know, We didn't know whether they were going to say it this way because normally you might have reacted this way and then they do something else and you got to shift. So that was kind of fun to do. And um, it always was, the, 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 to me, <laughs> I always look forward for the scene because that's when total chaos ensues. And that's when all the wacky starts happening. And it was it was a lot of fun, I have to say. It was. So that was my favorite memory of it. Yeah, it was it was just as zany as <laughs> the play. It just fit perfectly. Was that your idea, Gigi? Uh, yes, because the role was a small piv yeah, small pivotal role, but it was a small role. Mm -hmm. And how are we gonna get one of our heavy hitting, mature male actors in the company to to mm. commit to the run for this small role that comes in at the very end of the play. I thought we're never gonna be able to get people, somebody to commit. It'll be some me mediocre actor and you want a good actor in every single part. So that's why I came up with this idea because then they have the challenge of learning it yes. quickly yeah. and you know being backstage running their lines before they go out on stage for the one or two times that they did it. So that is why I thought of it. And then we were able to get, we were able to get a lot of different Amazing people, yeah. actors to come in for one or two performances. And that was a great, a great idea. It was, it was brilliant. Idea. It was brilliant. Mm -hmm. What about you, Karen? Um, oh, gosh. I mean, just the firecrackers going off. <laughs> uh, I just remember Tony and his diaper. I mean, <laughs> it just, you know, when they come in and they say, you know, everybody's under arrest and just the chaos and you know i i really had to not laugh on stage because <laughs> it was just you know just hilarity ensuing and i just i you know as i said i i enjoyed the actors and just seeing what they came up with and you know it was even when i wasn't on stage we were coming to watch the show like we were just all you know just so involved and just enjoyed the production so much you know, we showed up to watch the other cast and, and it was great. Larry Bates, you know, <laughs> got to meet. He was just great to work with. And, mm -hmm. and I'm a practical joker. I would tell him I was coming back for the show and then Verilyn would show up and he'd be like, what? <laughs> you know, so you working with double cast, it was, it, yeah. it was just a joy. Yeah. Just hilarious. And unfortunately we lost John, you know, who was, who played um, opposite. He was the, um, Remember John that was that worked with me. You worked more with Larry. John Wesley. Yeah, Wesley. John Wesley. He's yeah. no longer with us, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And he Joe. And Joe. That's another oh, one. We lost Grandpa's. Yeah. 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 Oh, actually, three because Bill. Remember Bill? Oh, is that a diff Oh, you know he was in the in the reading. Remember yeah. Bill? He was in the reading, but he didn't do the production. No. No, right, he but we lost. Could be health issues. Otherwise, I would have cast him. Right, and he then we lost him too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So three. You know, know what I loved about the play too, if I may, if I may, Alice, um, was this zany, chaotic madness, and you know, a, a real a real theme of love and inclusivity, 
and questioning of, of things, always questioning. But there was also a just a typical, beautiful, romantic love story. You know, Romeo and Juliet, we can't get together. There's a problem. And how do we solve this problem? How do we overcome this resistance, mm. this uh, familial resistance? And um, and I loved I loved the the romantic aspects. I love that the, the quiet scenes. There were some quiet scenes, you know, the two person scenes. Um, mostly it was just Alice and Tony, but mm-hmm. but um, but I think that was that was precious too. It's the it's the playwriting. It's just a beautifully constructed story. It's so layered, multi layered in in so many ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And so something we chatted about a little bit the other day was, um, and, and it's sort of specific to you can't take it with you, but there's sort of more broad questions about it too, because this kind of thing like you were talking about, comes up in a lot of like 20th century American plays where there are these uh, sort of, there are uh, assumptions that are made about about race, about gender, about all kinds of things. And so with a play like this, um, that also has so much to offer and that, that you know, is so warm hearted. Um, do you think for, for all three of you, is it a play that you would do now? If you were doing it now, are there things that you would, want to do to contextualize it, whether that's, you know, remarks before before a show or notes in the program or some adaptation to uh, to the play itself. Like where where does the where does you can't take it with you and, and other things that are like that, where do you feel like that fits in today? Well I, I don't think um, given all of what we've experienced over the last almost two years now, or even long before, really, all of the racial tension that's been going on in this country, I would take pause in wanting to accept the role again. Um, I think there are just so much broad, so many broader issues that are important to me now. Uh, Warm and fuzzy, which is what the play is really about, um, doesn't sit, you know, well in me right now. So um, I think it would be a hard sell uh, I think um, it, it's it's just not maybe somewhere down the line when things settle down. I don't know, but right now I think I think it would be a mistake to do that. Um, we have, you know, I don't mind. I think it's I don't mind having racial conversations and 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 of political issues in a play. I think we need that. And but to me, the conversation would have to be a, a different conversation. It would. Uh, it, it, it just has to be. I don't think that would be something that could play well now. It, no, it, no matter how you try to work out and try to invest it in things that, you know, that's not really on the page. Um, I, I don't think so. I think, um, I, I think if there was cert- a certain concept, you know, a conscious concept uh, or, you know, we're, we're working out now and we're, we're having conversations as Indians about, you know, all of these different uh, approaches to casting, uh, whether we're talking color conscious or color specific or, you know, cross-cultural. So I, I think because it's such a well-written piece and it has such great themes, um, I, I, I think it can be done. And I would be interested in seeing how we could come up with an idea where it could work um, because it's such a funny and solid play and you know just the themes in terms of uh, money and what's more important in life. I think those things certainly resonate coming out of this pandemic mm-hmm. uh, with people, you know, so um, I, I, I think it could be done. I, I don't have the answer, you know, but it, it'd be interesting to to explore, I think, because of the themes. You're right. I think the issues, the the the, the broader issue of the play, which is really love and 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 um, acceptance and so forth, and that and that's the, those issues are fine. I just think that the um, because even in the play, the, the one scene where there's the subject of race um, comes up, it comes up between the two uh, African American characters. So it's not an, an issue that's taken in the broader context of the play with any of the other characters in the play. So unless concept wise, as you suggest, unless there is a concept that takes it to the larger um, outside of just those two characters, because th- 
it's it's not it's it's almost like it's it's not a, a not it's a non-issue elsewhere um outside of of um with the rest of the family so conceptually i think it would have to be how do you approach that aspect that one little aspect which is to me such a looming thing how would you work that out that's that's what i think where the the conceptualness has to be worked on in that area of of broadening the, the idea or even the subject of race because it doesn't come up. There are lots of other races. We have the Countess, we have the Russian, we have all these, you know, different, you know, um, uh, subjects, you could, but ethnicities, but we don't explore that one, which seems like the obvious one in for this country. So um, unless that, that could be addressed, I don't know. I, I still hope, I, but I do agree that there are other other issues that can be um, important uh, to show and to speak on. But I think there are lots of other plays that can do that. I don't know that this one really needs to be the one to take to that extent. I love what both of you are saying. I, I, I mean, I'm totally on board with both of you. You know, I directed it again for USC uh, th three years later. Mm -hmm. um, and it was um, a very diverse cast. Um, I think we had to just take out some of the specifically, uh, you know, specific lines. Um, of the color of the... Of the yeah, of I'm the trying community. to remember. I'm not even sure that, yeah, I, we had to take out it. But I mean, that's kind of crucial to, because it's a private conversation. It's kind of crucial to Reba and Donald's, you know, uh, presence in the play. But I think we had to take that out in order to justify that it was a completely multi-racial, multi, -racial, mm -hmm. multi um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and more diverse um, in terms of the sexuality too. Um, I, anyway, I, I love where we're going with with this in the theater world. I love that we're, as usual, as creatives, sort of at the you know forefront. Even though I still feel like we're millions of years late, mm -hmm. but we're still at the forefront. In terms of our nation of uh you know putting stuff out there and and uh I'm, I'm going to the theater tomorrow night for the first time i'm so excited first time since the the pandemic i'm seeing octoroon oh i saw it yeah yeah a few weeks ago yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so, it's great the space is amazing you'll be it's it, it feels wonderful really mm -hmm. good yeah i'd love to hear what you think about the play mm -hmm. oh good well we'll talk about it mm -hmm. good yeah um yeah but you know but as usual in the theater you know this is a place for you know as radical as this play as you can't take it with you was in 1936 we now have to have a new you know a new radical and as a classical theater i mean i love my classics i love the shakespeare all that you know i, I love tennessee williams i love all the mid 20th century playwrights and and mm -hmm. late 1800s i mean the, the english playwrights and george bernard shaw and ibsen and all of them are just genius and I, I hope we can find a way to to still do them but then to diversify um what we're what we're presenting so there's some, some of everything and certainly reimagining those playwrights works what the discovering that's, new playwrights works discovering new playwrights works. playwrights of color playwright you know from every part of the world i mean absolutely the, the stories are all universal when we think about it, but sometimes it's nice to hear the perspective of a different um, uh, culture, culture other yeah. than just the old white, you know, European culture. So it's, um, and I think sometimes it's, uh, it's, you know, for me as a, a woman of color and an actress of color, you know, sometimes you want to, you want to explore your own experience, you know, and um, it's it's something that we don't often get a chance to do. And then sometimes when you think about playing these roles, you think, you know, um, and I love I love it too. I love all the writers you just mentioned. I love the I love the um, the classics a lot, which is why I wanted to be a part of Antius. Um, but I think there was sometimes at some parts of me is like I, I want I want to experience something other. I want I want you know to experience something that's close to me that I could in investigate and explore and and share. And um, and so I think that's why it's imperative to really now open up the canon and and um, and see what what we find because there there are lots of beautiful work being done by a lot of writers of color 
And, you know, it, you just, we just have to delve in there and see, and there are a lot of adaptations, um, you know, that, that are out there or that maybe we can, um, you know, when we're writing, we have a playwrights um, lab, you know, who is going to write the next classical piece. And, you know, that's why, why, why do we always have to go back to the old playwrights that <laughs> we could, you know, there, there could be some writers today who can give us something that's in the in the realm of, of classics with the texts and all of the stuff that we love to do. So it's it's opportunities. It's just like the lab gives these playwrights the opportunity to come up with with new works. You know, it's it's the same thing, you know, just expand that to a, a classical vein or or take a piece that we love and adapt it and reimagine it. In the whole thing for a new audience for you know new voices to to approach and i think to me that's what's exciting because theater is at the cusp of something different and something new i mean when we were just doing plays normally in the day you know you do the play and that's it you go home afterwards the, the audience walks away now we want to involve our audience so we have just what we're doing now you know talkbacks and and so that's a new thing it's it's like having salons where people can really come and really talk and and explore the work more than just seeing it on the stage so the theater space itself has to be reimagined we have to make space for these things for uh so it's it's to me it's very exciting it's a really is and and i think we had to have this upheaval you know um in our in our society to to really see that there, there must be we must come out on the other side we can't stay on the same path because you see what happens when we do, when we don't acknowledge um, what's in front of us, racism. We don't acknowledge that. Uh, it's, it's a century old um, conversation. Uh, it's not an easy fix. Obviously, if it was, it would be fixed by now. But I think what's different now is that it's more out there. It's, it's, it's on the table, it's open. No, you know, we're not trying to hide it and act like it doesn't exist. So. I think that's the only way we could move forward is when we really um, look at, at look at ourselves and um, and and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. And and it used to be, I think it was. I mean, for me, the last few years, I was sort of panicky in my directing of pursuits at Antias. I just I wanted to have more people of color, more people of color, more people. But that was the only solution. It's not just more people of color exactly. in Edmonton. It's like, what else are we going to be? You know, let's present other other mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. Place. Right, because sometimes what, what it feels like is that you, you, you feel like you're just being put in as opposed to, you know, stepping in from, you know, ground one, level one and, and be, you know, it's, it's, it's just a dynamic I think sometimes the larger society does not think about and, um, and, and it's, it's for years, you know, it's things that we've had to, you know, harbor or hold in or, you know, we didn't have the forum, the platform to talk about it. So, um, Let's let's hope that um, it's not just a one-off, and that it's all going to kind of go back when things mellow out and get quiet again. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much, Gigi Birmingham, Carolina White, Verlyn Jones, and host Alice Johnson for that conversation on Kaufman and Hearts. You can't take it with you. Uh, I'm Bill Brocktrup, and on behalf of all of us at the book club, thank you. <laughs>